like I said, it's a crisp fall morning. It's a football weather. And as football coaches like to say, football is a game of four quarters. It's not enough to start well. It's not enough to be leading at the half. You've got to lead at the end to win. If they're the first, this was the most. In many ways, the Christian life is like that. It's not enough to start with the bang. You've also got to end well. Right? <laughs> Too many people enter the Christian life with uh, great enthusiasm, only to have it disappear into mediocrity along the way. So many uh, lack purpose in life. Uh, sometimes I count myself as one of those. They are like the man who jumped on his horse and madly rode off in all directions. <laughs> we have too many amateur Christians who are uh, a mile wide and about an inch deep. Following Jesus Christ is not a hobby. It's not collecting stamps or anything like that. It, it demands a total commitment of your life. From two verses before our text for this morning and on through today's reading, St. Paul shares four principles for winning the prize when the game of life is over. Principle one, check your direction. Not that, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one, th but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul begins with the honest admission, I'm not there yet. Unlike so many of his contemporaries and ours, he has no problem in admitting his own personal shortcomings. He isn't perfect yet, and he knows it, and that's the place where all of his spiritual growth begins. Twice he says, I press on, meaning I'm not where I want to be, but I'm going to keep moving in that direction. In the spiritual life, direction makes all the difference. True believers aren't in heaven yet, but they aim their steps in that path. Note the fierce concentration in Paul's words, one thing I do. Here's the secret that applies across the board to everything. To excel in any area of life, a person must say, one thing I do, not 20 things I do. A single-minded focus like this with blinders on uh, in any endeavor generally wins the great reward. A great artist must say, one thing I do. A gifted teacher, a champion athlete, all must say, one thing I do. In Paul's case, it meant looking to the heavenly goal of winning the prize. The phrase covers all that God has for us when we finally stand before Jesus Christ and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. When Dr. David Livingstone, pioneer medical missionary to Africa, returned home to Great Britain, he was asked, where do you want to go now? And he replied immediately, I'm ready to go anywhere, providing that it's forward. Do you want to win the race set before you? First, check your direction. Make sure you're moving in God's direction. Everyone goes somewhere in life. Where will you be when uh, you get where you're going? Remember, anywhere you're at, let's say anywhere you go, there you are. Principle two, follow faithful leaders. He says, Paul says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we already have attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who will live according to the pattern we gave you. Now, now note how Paul has said, follow my example. That seems like an astounding thing to say. <laughs> follow me, because I'm perfect. If you want to learn how to pray, follow me. If you want to become a faithful evangelist, follow me. If you want to study the Bible, if you want to see compassion in action, if you want to know God better, follow me. Who among us uh, would dare to utter such statements? Not me. Yet six different times in the New Testament, St. Paul says, follow me. Was he an egotistical braggart? No. Did he think he was a perfect Christian? In his words, God forbid. He clearly says that he has not yet arrived at spiritual completion. Well, then, how could Paul say, follow me? Well, what he meant was, follow me as I follow Christ. Think of the Christian life as the long parade from earth to heaven. And at the head of the line is Jesus Christ, and step by step he's leading us followers to his glory. It's a long road with many twists and turns, and he's fully committed to seeing that we make it. Since the parade is long and filled with millions of people, we need folks in front of us who can keep us on track. We need mentors, models, heroes, if you will, someone who are, are farther along in the spiritual journey who can keep us pointed toward the Lord, and without such input, we're likely to veer off into the wilderness. Well, let me ask you two questions. One, who are you following? Who's up ahead of you showing you the way? 
pointing out the rough places in the road, making sure that you don't make a wrong turn. We all need people like that in our lives. None of us ever reaches a point where we can say, I can do this on my own. Well, we do, but we're wrong. Uh, even though I've been a Christian for nearly 30 years, uh, I find that now, as ever, I need the encouragement of being around people who pray better than I do, who witness better than I do, and who have a deeper knowledge of God's Word. Uh, I need their example, their encouragement, and the challenge they provide to my life. And I must say that I have been blessed beyond words to have a mentor like the Archdeacon in my pursuit of uh, holy orders. It's, it's, he's had fun, I hope. <laughs> it's just, it's still him. It's still, yeah, it's still there. <laughs> it's every day. Uh, but this touches a practical point. Would you like to learn to pray? It's not hard. Just hang around people who pray, right? Would you like to grow in joy? We'll spend time with joyful people. Do you wish you had a heart for the world? We'll spend time with missionaries, and your heart will change little by little. Are you struggling with temptation? We'll find someone who's fought and won the same battle. Would you like to develop the gift of teaching? Great. Sit at the feet of great teachers. Learn from them. Follow faithful leaders. And soon enough, their godly example will make you a better Christian. Remember I said I had two questions? Well, the second, rather than who are you following, the greater question is, who's following you? Think about that. The image of the great parade again. Jesus stands at the front. You strain to catch a glimpse, but it's hard to see through the crush of people. So you simply begin to follow the crowd in front of you. Right? As long as they're following Jesus, you're following him through their good example. Now look behind you. You see all the faces peering in your direction. They're following you, and you didn't even realize it, did you? As long as you follow those who follow Christ, you'll be following him too. And so will all those who follow you. Right now, someone is following you. Right now, someone looks to you to show them the way. Someone prays because they heard you pray. Someone is watching you fight your personal battles. And someone wants to be like you. Right now, someone sees Christ in your life and admires your strength. Right now, someone is borrowing your faith because they have none. Someone believes you're the best Christian they know. Right now, someone is smiling when they think of you. <sighs> right now, someone is following you. Keep on the path. Keep your eyes on the prize and find good examples and follow them. And don't forget that someone is following you as you follow others who are following Jesus Christ. Don't let that someone down. The third principle is know your enemies. St. Paul says, For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. We'll see here is the flip side of the previous principle. We must follow faithful leaders, sure, but we must watch out for our enemies. Who are these enemies of the cross? I doubt if St. Paul would use such harsh language to describe people outside the church. I believe he's talking about profession, professing Christians who are really wolves in sheep's clothing. Although they attend church and worship on Sunday, they're not one of us. Here's the tricky part. They're not out there. They're in here. How do you spot them? Well, they claim to be Christians, and so right off the bat, you should be <laughs> should be alert. They claim to be Christians. No. Their lives portray them. They live for self-gratification. They have lust, gluttony, greed, immorality, anger, drunkenness, and all the other sins of the flesh. They brag about their sins. Remember, their glory is their shame. They drag others down with them. They will destroy you if you let them. They are going to hell. Don't go with them. Let me say it this way. Not every relationship is good for you. Some people hearing my words are aware of relationships in their lives that are pulling them away from Jesus Christ. It may be a romantic relationship or a friendship on the job or a neighbor or perhaps just a passing casual acquaintance. But God's point is clear. If a relationship is pulling you away from Jesus Christ, you must break it off. Period. No ifs, ands, buts. Do it now. Stop making. I can't tell you who needs to hear those words, but I do know that someone does. Know your enemies. Mark them. Avoid them. There's no other way to win the prize. There's no other way to affect the person following you. And that leaves us with the fourth principle. Remember your true identity. 
Paul says, but our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. This begins with a huge contrast. The enemies of the cross live for earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. Those words would have had special meaning to the Philippians since they were granted Roman citizenship, even though they were 800 miles from the imperial capital. They lived in Philippi, but their citizenship was in Rome. In a similar way, we live on earth, but our hearts are in heaven. As the song says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Uh, it's kind of like when you travel to a different country like Alabama, uh, a passport is required for entry into those countries. For instance, if you travel to Alabama and you take your U.S. passport with you wherever you go, that way you can prove that you're a citizen of the United States. Okay, I'm sorry. Paul is saying that Christians have been issued a spiritual passport from the commonwealth of heaven. Then he lit, lists two proofs of that heavenly citizenship. First, we're eager for Jesus to return to the earth. The phrase, eagerly await, has the idea of a child on his tiptoes looking out the window waiting for daddy to come home. Second, we're expecting a glorious transform transformation of our bodies. The word transform comes from a Greek word that is the root of our English word schematic, meaning a drawing or diagram of the inner workings of a device. What do we know about our physical bodies? I tell you, I've learned a lot in the last few months about mine. We know they're made from the dust. Second, we know they're constantly wearing out. Third, we know that our bodies will eventually return to the earth from whence they came, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's why the King James Version uses the phrase, our vile bodies, an expression that becomes more appropriate as we grow older and nothing seems to work right anymore. Uh, Philippians 3 ends with a ringing declaration that one day God is going to re-schematic our earthly bodies. They will be raised from the dead and re-engineered to be like his glorious bodies, or in the words of my mother, we will be raised and beautified. I like that. I need to be raised. I need to be beautified. And God will do it by the same power that enables him to run the entire universe. Think of it. No more glasses, no more crutches, no more walkers, no more ICUs, no cancer, no Alzheimer's, no diabetes, no kidney failure, no disease, and no more business. I'm sorry, no more death. Okay, he's on the road. This is uh, something in, in part of my conclusion. You know how you're always getting something corny and hokey and email. Somebody finds something and they just pass it along to you. Well, I got this from a friend of mine in Texas. His name is Sean Scholl, and his claim to fame is his farm butts up against George Bush's in Crawford, Texas. Uh, it seems maybe maybe you've heard the story, but it's new to me. So, in a very touching way, it illustrates the final truth of that text. It seems a woman had been diagnosed with cancer and was given three months to live. Her doctor told her to start making preparations to die. Well, something we should all be doing, right? So she contacted her pastor and had him come over. They went over the songs she wanted sung at the service. She told him that uh, what scriptures she would like read and she wanted uh, what she wanted to be wearing. She also told the pastor that she would like to be buried with her favorite Bible. Everything was in order and he was about to leave when the woman suddenly remembered something very important. There's one more thing, she says. What's that? The pastor replied. This is very important. The woman continued. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor stood looking at the woman, not knowing quite what to say. That shocks you, doesn't it? The woman asked. Well, to be honest, I'm puzzled by your request, he says. In all my years of attending church socials and functions where food was involved, and let's face it, food's always all right. right? You think I'm 300 pounds. Uh, my favorite part, she says, uh, was when whoever was cleaning, clearing away the dishes at the main course would lean over and say, you can keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew that something was coming that was better. When they told me to keep my fork, I knew that it was going to be great. It wasn't jello or rice pudding. No, no, it was cake. Pie. Something with substance, right? Well, what's with the fork? She said, that's what people will ask when they pass by my castle. And then I want you to tell them something better is coming, so keep your fork too. And the pastor's eyes were welled up with tears of joy as he hugged the woman goodbye. He knew this would be one of the last times he'd ever see her alive, but he also knew that that woman had a better grasp of heaven 
than he did. She knew something better was coming. At the funeral, people were walking by the woman's casket and they saw the pretty dress she was wearing in her favorite Bible and the fork placed in her right hand. Over and over, the pastor heard the question, what's with the fork? And over and over, he smiled. During his message, he told the people of the conversation he'd had with the woman shortly before she died. He also told them about the fork and what it symbolized to her. The pastor told the people how he could not stop thinking about the fork and that they probably would not be able to stop thinking about it either. And he was right. So the next time you reach for your fork, let it remind you that there is something better coming. Now let me close with this recap. As Christians, we're to go for the gold. You can win the prize of eternal life if you will, one, check your direction, two, follow faithful leaders, three, know your enemies, and four, remember your true identity. On this 23rd Sunday after, in the, after Trinity, we're thankful and saved. Amen. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus had to say this more blessed to give than to receive.